Well, good morning to you. My name is Stephen, and I serve as the pastor here at Grace Covenant Church, Capitol Hill. I want to welcome everybody, but especially if you're new with us, welcome to Grace. We're so glad to have you on our 40th anniversary month. Yeah. It's exciting. Come on now, you can do better than that. There you go. Two things I want to share before we jump into the, the sermon today. Um, the day before our four-day fast, I was walking around our neighborhood and uh, praying, and I felt like the Lord spoke to me pretty specifically. And so I wanted to share that with you. We have been raising money um, for our church plants, future church plants, and our, even this building. Um, we want to win the city for Jesus. And it's going to take churches to do that, church buildings and a people of God that assemble and go out into the community. And so we're having a gala uh, September 24th. You've, many of you have heard about this gala in which we're raising money, all of which will go to uh, the church buildings that we're hoping to purchase and that we already own. Well, as a part of that gala, um, we have platinum tables, and we're trying to sell one more platinum table for $10,000. I recognize most people can't do that. In fact, most of the people who have purchased one of those tables have been corporations and people that partner with the church. Um, but as I was praying, I saw a picture of four young women who went in together. Um, and so if that speaks to you at all, could you come and talk to me after the service? And if you're not a young woman and would like to contribute, you can still do that, and I will happily... <laughs> be wrong about this. But I saw that very specific picture and uh, wanted to mention that to you. Secondly, um, I've, I've said this before, we do a lot of offerings and we're unapologetic about it because God loves a cheerful giver and we know how we use the resources to better his kingdom. And so we have been doing a series of offerings that will all go to the, the ministries and the organizations that we're partnering with in the DMV area. Nate mentioned earlier uh, that next Saturday, this upcoming Saturday, we're going to have 25 uh, service projects throughout the city, and we're actually going to hand a check to each of those organizations. And so we had this audacious goal of raising $200,000. Many of you participated in that, and I wanted to give you an update. Oh my gosh, it's already up there. We did it. We did it. So... Keep this on the low, but when we go to Little Lights on Saturday, we're going to hand them a check for $20,000. Um, and all of our partners, all the areas that we're serving are going to get a check from Grace Covenant Church, and it's because of you. So thank you for your generosity. Really, really big deal. I started coming to Grace Covenant Church in third grade with my family. And as a third grader, I had dreams, ambitions, right? I wanted to be the next president of the United States, play NBA basketball, right? Maybe have a corner office on Wall Street. Um, I had these big ambitions, but all of my ambitions centered around one person. Do you know who they centered around? They centered around me. And when I came into the church, um, there were two things that really, really resonated with me. One was the relationships many of whom the people I'm walking with decades now that it's been. Um, but secondly, was when I heard this man who was then called Pastor Brett. Now he's the bishop who oversees uh, all of our locations uh, as a part of Grace Covenant Church. But he unpacked this vision of winning the city. And if you're new to us, maybe this is new to you, but we have this audacious vision. We have this big vision that's bigger than just our church. It's going to take churches all throughout the DMV might be something that takes multiple generations to accomplish, but we want to see the city of Washington, D.C. and its surrounding suburbs one to Jesus Christ. We want to see the education realm. We want to see politics. We want to see business, the sports world impacted by this gospel, people coming to know Jesus, and not through uh, the many ways that militaries, I mean, that, it's not a military thing. It's through souls being one to Jesus. That, when we say win the city, that's what we mean, is us carrying the light of Jesus Christ in those places, in the darkness, and people finding a relationship with Jesus. Amen? And so today, we are continuing a series that we're going to do all month uh, on our 40th anniversary. 
Pastor Mark kicked it off last week talking about the impossible start that was Grace Covenant Church 40 years ago. And yesterday, as we were at this picnic with over a 1,000 people there from all of our different locations, I couldn't help but think, wow, the fact that it all started with Pastor Mark and Debbie and a team of 10 people. Don't underestimate how your little yes to God can lead to long-term fruit and lives being changed. In many ways, you sitting here today is a result of that original team. So we talked about that initial vi vision and the, the boldness of crucial beliefs that have stuck, stood with us even 40 years later. But today, I want to unpack a little bit more about this vision of winning the city. I want to look at a biblical basis for where we get this from. It's not the only passage, but it's one of one passage that I speak that I think really speaks to this vision that we have and a key aspect to how we're going to see this vision realized. I know here today there are a variety of perspectives when it comes to Washington, D.C. Some of you are here and perhaps you're just moved here to D.C. or the suburbs in Maryland or Virginia and you're excited about what the city has to offer. You're excited about your new job or maybe the university that you're going to. Others of you, if you're honest, maybe you're fed up with the city. The expes expensive housing market, the traffic, the hustle and bustle, some of the division and nastiness that exists in this city. For others of you, maybe you do live on the outskirts, you know, in the suburbs, and, and for you, like, D.C. is kind of like out of sight, out of mind. It's like, yeah, I'm here, but kind of not here. And so when we talk about winning the city, it's like, okay, that sounds really cool for, like, for them but I'm not sure I can really resonate with that. Some of you might just be passing through this, this area for a couple months, uh, maybe for, on an internship, internship or a short-term assignment. You know you're only gonna be here for a year or two years or maybe three months, so it's like, eh, do I really wanna like, really get invested with our vision here? My hope today is that however long God has you here, that he would reignite or ignite for the first time a passion to see this city transformed. This psalm starts that we looked at, Psalm 48, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. And here is the main issue at hand, is that our great God is not praised like he deserves to be praised in this city. As I've gotten to know this city, I, live, I grew up maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes away from here, but my wife and I, we moved into the city about a year ago. And as I've gotten to know the city, I've noticed that some things are worshipped here in the city. But it's not God. Power is worshipped in this city. Being busy is celebrated and lifted up as the ultimate standard. Coexist and tolerance are shouted from the rooftops. Even the Washington Commanders, although they have not had very little success, they've had very little success, even the Washington Commanders are praised at points in our city. But God is not praised. God is not praised. And I hope that stirs in you a holy agitation, that you're a little bit bothered by that, that in the most important city in the United States of America, God is not praised like he deserves to be praised. Now, Washington, D.C., newsflash, it's not in the Bible. Didn't know if you knew that. Assume you probably do. United States of America in our history of 450 years is not in the Bible. But there was a city and is a city very close to God's heart that I think has some parallels to the city that we're called to. And I think we can derive some clues for how God called his people to relate to their city so that we can relate best to ours. And it's the city of Zion. The title of this message is the city of our God, the city of our God. Now, Zion is a term that many of us are familiar with. Maybe we've heard about it. Uh, we sing worship songs and hear that word Zion. A lot of churches are named after Zion, like Mount Zion, Baptist Church, or churches like that. Zion has become a cool name to name your kids. So there's a lot of boys and girls named Zion. But I think if we're very honest, most of us probably have no clue what Zion is or what it means. So there's three really significant aspects of Zion. First, Zion was a real, literal, historical place. It was a nickname for Jerusalem. And it included the temple where God was worshipped 
by the priests and where people would offer their offerings. And it was the center of religious life in Israel. The people looked at Zion with pride. That was where God dwelled. And so the writer of this psalm, the sons of Korah, they wrote 12 psalms uh, in our Bible. These were temple singers in Zion. During the time of David, the time of Solomon, they worshiped God, and they would use this psalm and other psalms to sing praises to God. And so this psalm was, was written as a song to God, celebrating him and his greatness and the beauty of the city of Zion. And we don't know the exact occasion for which this psalm was written, but there's a couple moments in Zion's history that we think the sons of Korah could be referring to. I want to mention one of, you to, to, one of them to you today. And that's in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. There was a king named Jehoshaphat. Now, Zion is a very trendy name. I would not recommend Jehoshaphat as a child's name. But Jehoshaphat was one of the better kings of Judah. And he actually followed God. He actually followed in the the steps of some of uh, Judah's greatest leaders. He got rid of the idols. He was a man that really pursued the things of God. But he made a very terrible alliance with the king of the northern tribes of Israel, Ahab. And that alliance got him into some serious trouble. And so there's this moment where these surrounding enemies of Judah come against them, Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir. And Jehoshaphat is literally, he doesn't know what to do. He's terrified because he's outnumbered. And he utters this this famous line that you might have heard. He says, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you. And as he cries out to God, a prophet of God who speaks on behalf of God named Jehaziel comes to him and he reassures Jehoshaphat. He says, the battle is not yours, but God's. The battle is not yours, but God's. And Jehoshaphat is suddenly filled with faith and encouragement because he knows that God is going to deliver Judah from their enemies. And God instructs Jehoshaphat not to send out the fiercest warriors, not to, fe- not to devise this military scheme. He tells them to send out the worshipers. The worshipers. And 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 22 says, And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, and all who came against Judah, so that they were routed. Judah got deliverance that day because of their praise, their worship to God. The sons of Korah, reflecting on this moment in the psalm that we just read in verse 4, they said, for behold, the kings assembled. They came on together. You can feel the the terror and the the fear and the anxiety of Jehoshaphat and the nation of of Judah in this moment and moments like this in Judah's history. But verse 5, as soon as they saw these enemy kings, they were astounded. They were in panic, and they took to flight. I love how he paints this picture. He says, trembling took hold of them there, anguish as a woman in labor. By the east wind, you shattered the ships in Tarshish. What the sons of Korah are depicting is this great victory that God brought for his people, all through the people's worship. God is great, and his greatness can be seen in how he fights for you and me. Amen? Amen. Praise unleashes the power of our great God. It invites him to intervene in our situations. See, maybe you walked into this service this morning, and like worship was kind of like a warm-up, you know? Like you're walking in the rain, and it's kind of a sleepy Sunday morning, and you know, you're kind of, and this is kind of human nature. We like sit back and we like maybe evaluate the singers today and the guitarist, and oh, that's a new worship team member. Oh, this isn't my favorite song. Oh, I actually really like that song. You know, we're kind of doing that thing. But the sons of Korah got this revelation in verse 8. As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts. They had heard the stories of Judah's deliverance. They had seen with their own eyes the power of worship, how worship alone invites our great God to fight our battles. They didn't have to, the people of Judah didn't have to wield a sword or raise a shield. All they had to lift was their arms, and all they had to lift was their voices. And as they began to sing and worship God, God fought and defeated their enemies. 
And family, I know here this morning that the sons of Korah are not the only ones who've heard and who've seen of our great God. I know you have a testimony of a job that you were unqualified for seemingly, and God brought you that job that you prayed for. I know many of you were in a financial pitfall, and God miraculously delivered you out of that situation. I know some of you didn't know what you were going to do in a housing situation, and all of a sudden, God, in the last moment, brought the home exactly what you need. I know some of you have experienced the life-changing power of the gospel in and through you when you were stuck in an addiction. You were stuck in the bondage, and God brought you through. You have seen and you have heard the greatness of our God. I was with a college student last week who I've been walking with. Um, He is so close to accepting Jesus Christ. And he's been going through the gospel of Mark. He's been reading it. God's been speaking to him. But he's wrestling with, is Jesus really the only way? And so he asked me, how do you know Jesus is the only way? I mean, there are people who believe in different gods, and what if you were you know, maybe born in a different nation and worshiped a different god? And I said, you know, the greatest evidence for the fact that Jesus rose from the dead is a Christian's life who's been transformed. And I can't deny the transformation that I've experienced. I can't deny that when I don't read the Bible, I'm impatient, I'm rude, I'm selfish. But when I do open up the Bible, the word of God begins to change my heart. He starts filling me with faith. He starts giving me perspective. I can't deny how the great God that we serve moves in my lives and many of your stories, can, you can attest how God has moved in yours. And that's why we need small groups like we're going to talk about at the end of service today, is because we need groups of friends and family where we can remind each other of what God's done. We can stand with each other in those Jehoshaphat moments where we feel surrounded. We feel like the enemy's closing in and God supernaturally intervenes and the people in our circle go, hey, 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 this is a moment for God to move in your circumstance. We need that faith collectively. We need people standing with us so we can worship our way. To those victories. Zion was a real, literal city of Jerusalem in ancient Israel, but it's also symbolic for what we experienced this morning. The presence of God when we worship him, when we praise him. A little Zion is established here in this church when we come together and lift up the name of Jesus. I'm grateful that though we didn't live thousands of years ago in the ancient city of Zion, we experience it on Sunday mornings when we come with an atmosphere of faith, when we come ready to lift holy hands to our God. Amen? Amen. But then there's a future fulfillment of Zion, and this is important. You see that in this psalm that not all of this psalm has been fulfilled yet. Verse 2 says, referring to Zion, it's beautiful in elevation. It's the joy of the whole earth. Well, Zion was never, the ancient city of Zion, was never the joy of the whole earth. That promise did not come to pass yet. Verse 8, the city of our God, which God will establish forever. God has not established Jerusalem forever, but he will. See, there's a future fulfillment of Zion. Zion is the new Jerusalem. That scripture speaks of. And all of human history is heading to this point where heaven comes down to earth. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 talked about all things being united in Christ. The things in heaven and things in earth. God is not trying to blow up this earth and start over. He's renewing this world. He's trying to take us back to what was established in the Garden of Eden when we had perfect fellowship with God, when there was no sin, when there was no death, when there was no disease. God is bringing us to that place. And New Jerusalem is the fulfillment. It's the fulfillment of when heaven invades earth. Now that we have the theological foundation set and you meet a Zion, you say, let me tell you a little bit about what your name means. Here's the problem, that those in our city have not experienced the victories that ancient Zion experienced. They haven't heard and seen the symbolic aspect of Zion like we did this morning. If they don't know Jesus, they won't be there for that future fulfillment of Zion. And so no one in our city other than the people of God right now can say in verse 1, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. 
We need our city to experience a taste of Zion here in D.C. The 800,000 people in D.C., the 6 million people that live in the DMV, we need them to experience the real Zion. But how? I mean, if you were to devise a plan, and I started the sermon thinking about, okay, win the city. God, how are we going to do that? And I felt like the Holy Spirit led me to Zion. And so I was ready for some strategy. I was ready to draw up some plans to pull out the whiteboard, you know, create a one-year, five-year, ten-year initiative. Like, I was ready to go. I was ready to come up with, you know, some Bible studies and small groups and evangelism and outreach. And all of that is so important and so needed. And God moves through those means. But as I read this psalm, and I started thinking about the demonic forces in our city, we don't go up against Amnon and Moab and Mount Seir, but we do go up against economic injustice in our city. We do, do go up against racial disparities. We do go up against division. We do go up against loneliness. D.C. is the loneliest city in the United States statistically. We do go against spiritual apathy that the majority of the people in this city have. Last night, or Friday night, a couple of us guys were playing basketball at the elementary school. We do go against hopelessness. We play with some guys who were just hopeless. They're just hopeless. And we had an opportunity to pray for them and minister to them at the end. But hopelessness pervades our city. How do we go up against those enemies? I mean, I have big faith, and I love this church, and this church is amazing, but in all of our locations, we're probably a couple thousand people in a city of 800,000 people. What is our hope to see this city one with the other churches in the DMV area? This is what the sons of Korah say, verse 9. You ready? Here's their plan. We've thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. Think. Thinking on the love of God. That does not seem like a great victory plan. Verse 11, let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Rejoicing. That is our spiritual strategy to win the city. See, we, I love Gen Y, Gen Z, my generation, Gen Y. We, man, we're all about the Maverick City. We're all about Upper Room, man, the ghosty worship music, the Holy Ghost. You know, we love to just sit in the spontaneous and just, it just ministers to us and we feel the Spirit of God. But worship is not just about how we feel. Worship is about worshiping Him who's worthy. It's more about him than it's about us. I'm thankful that God changes us and he changes our perspective and he changes our heart when we worship. But worship is primarily about God receiving what he deserves. And when we worship God, not only is it about him first and foremost, he does change us, yes, but also what happens is things start changing in the atmosphere. Things that felt stuck See, Pastor Mark tells the story of when they started this church, there were moments that they faced opposition. There were countless moments. He talked about this with the impossible start, that their backs were up against the wall, and they would come together, and they would pray, and they would worship, and that spirit of heaviness would lift off. That's a part of who we are as a people. That when we worship, we're not just sitting here, you know, singing nice songs and, oh, man, that's good. And No, we are moving heaven and earth. The heavens are shaking. Angels are being dispatched. One of the most counterintuitive things we can do, but most effective things we can do is to worship our God. It's not just tradition to start our services this way. It's a strategy from Almighty God. Because the same things that the sons of Korah experienced and wrote about the ancient victories of Zion are the same victories we experience today when the people of God begin to give God praise. That's the whole point of this psalm, is that all the people of, of Zion had, they didn't have anything except God. And yet that's all that they needed. Church, what do we what, what, how can we commend ourselves? I mean, we got a building, okay. We got some people who have some leadership gifts on their life, if I do say so myself, okay. <laughs> you know, we have a gifted and a worship team. We have some, many of you are serving in the church and are effective in ministry. But do you think any of that is going to win our city? We need God to do the impossible. And the great news is, 
God is like kind of in the business of doing the impossible. And so when we worship him, when we call on him, we invite him to intervene and to move and to do what we can't do. I know there's probably folks here today who are thinking, but what if I don't feel like thinking about God's love and rejoicing? How do you rejoice when you go through challenging situations? Maybe you've experienced a tragedy in your family. Maybe you're tired of a job that you're going to day in and day out. Maybe you're ready to give up on your marriage. Maybe you're ready to get out of this city. My wife and I, when we had our our second child, Willow, who had so many health challenges, um, the doctors told us she wasn't going to be born alive. She spent three, uh, two and a half months in the NICU. And during that time, we had a, a one-year-old, and we would drive from our home in Sterling, Virginia, to, to Fairfax, long drives, fighting through traffic. Oftentimes, we could only see her for maybe an hour. I remember it was such a challenging moment. It was so stressful. Um, I actually totaled my, my mom's car on the way to the hospital. I mean, just everything that could have gone wrong. Uh, went wrong during that season. And like I mentioned before, you know, I'm a a Maverick City upper room type of guy. I'm not a big fan of like 91.9. No offense if you are. Local radio station here, Christian station. Man, I know some of you blast it and more power to you if that's you. (laughs) But that's not necessarily my jam. I thought, you know, those songs are pretty cheesy. But as I'm going through making these drives during the most difficult moment, two and a half months of my wife and, and my li- our lives, and those songs would come on, those, those songs that I would hear over and over again that I just didn't give a second thought to, all of a sudden, in those moments, those words brought me life. And I began to worship with those songs. And it didn't, it, at that point, it didn't matter what the songs were. It didn't matter how, what I thought. I mean, that was my soundtrack to victory. And as we worshiped in that car to that doctor, you know, to the NICU in, in Fairfax, when we made those drives and we didn't have faith in many moments and we didn't have the answers and we didn't know what was going to happen, God was fighting our battles. He was fighting our battles. And now she's five years old. She's doing all the things that doc- or six years old. She's doing all the things that doctors said she'd never be able to do. We saw God do a medically documented miracle. We have our own Psalm 48 to sing to God. And all of you have a testimony, perhaps. If you don't, maybe today's the day that your testimony starts. But my prayer is that we would have the testimony of verses 13 and 14 of this psalm. The sons of Korah say, hey, go throughout Zion. Take a, you know, there's so many tours. You can take a Segway tour. You can take a, you know, you can have somebody ride you, a bi- ride a bike, you know, across the Washington, D.C. and see all the monuments and see all the museums. And that's what was happening in this passage. The, the sons, of course, say, hey, go throughout the city of Zion. Consider well her ramparts. Go through her citadels. Take an inventory. Because as you see this great city of Zion, you may tell the next generation, verse 14, that this is God. Our God forever and ever. He will guide us forever. My prayer is our testimony as a church, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, is that my kids, we would take them across to the different church buildings in each of the wards. We take them across where the kingdom of God has been established in the Washington Wizards, the Washington Commanders, at Georgetown, at George Washington, at American, at Howard, at Gallaudet. We could take them on a tour of Washington, D.C. in the public schools and the charter schools. We could take them on a, t- on a tour at some of the NGOs in the city and some of the biggest businesses in the city where the spirit of God is moving, where there are believers shining their light, where there are Bible studies that have been started and marriages that have been reconciled and families that have been restored. My prayer is that as we walk this city in 20 years or 30 years, or maybe it's the next generation as they're taking their kids around the city, that this would be our testimony, that our God is great. Come see what he's done. As I invite the worship team to our praise, we, some of, to the stage, some of you might have noticed if you're like really astute, and now some of you guys like really pay attention to details, we only did three songs this morning. Sorry to disappoint you, because we're going to do two songs at the end. We're going to respond to this message in in praise. And I want to challenge you this week to do three things. One is just personally, 
And some of you need to just pull out your phone right now, Google Calendar, Outlook, whatever you do to keep you know, your schedule, and just pencil in five minutes this week before you go to bed, maybe when you, after you wake up, just to write down what God has done for you and just to praise him for that, thank him for that. Those of, you who, those of you who are married, the hardest thing, I'm convinced the hardest thing you can do as a couple, I think you can probably run a half marathon or a marathon together. That would be easier than what I'm about to tell you to do. Taking five minutes and praising God together. There's something so hard about that. I don't know why. I think it's because the enemy knows how powerful a couple is praising God together. And if you just hold your hands and maybe one of you is a little more introverted, one of you is more extroverted, one of you is a little more outgoing, you know, one of you is a little more reserved, but you just hold hands and you just worship God together for five minutes. Secondly, I want to challenge you. We're doing our small group uh, open house this week when you jump into with your small groups or the next time that you guys meet, just to take a few minutes before you get into the passage for that week and just thank God together. Just praise God for the victories that he's brought to each and every member of your group. And then lastly, stand to your feet. Lastly, we're gonna one more time praise and worship our God. We're gonna thank him. We're gonna lift up his name. We're gonna lift holy hands. We're gonna lift our voices to him. We're gonna move heaven and earth as we worship. We're gonna thank God for the nine months that we've been in existence as a church the relationships that he's brought us, the open door at Tyler Elementary and down the street at the Marine Barracks and Little Lights and Sasha Bruce. We're gonna thank him for the people who've got baptized in this bathtub right here behind me, like Chloe Burke, the people who've gotten saved and responded to the gospel. We're gonna thank him for that. And as we do, as we lift up his name, God is fighting our battles. He's fighting them right now. So we praise you. Go ahead and lift up a voice to Jesus. Just thank him for who he is. Come on, don't wait for the worship team to lead you. Just praise God for how great he is. Lord, you're great. We worship you. We praise you. We move heaven and earth right now with our singing, with our shouting, with our clapping, and with our hands raised in Jesus' name.
lift up a shout of praise to our mighty God this morning. voices to God. you're doing in our lives, Lord, and in this city. You are worthy of all the honor and the praise and the glory. You and you alone, Lord, there's no one like you. Thank you, God. Sing Adonai.
just felt in this moment. There's such faith that's built in this room right now. It's rising in our hearts. As we've lifted up the name of Jesus, now he's going to respond with specific answers to prayer that we've been believing God for. And I just believe there's a story. I Forgive me. I don't know some of the details. But a prophet comes to the king and he says, strike the ground. And this, this king struck the ground three times. And the prophet said, if you would have struck the ground seven times, I would have given you victory over your enemies. But because you just struck it three times, I'm not. And there's some specific things that we've been crying out to God for. The military, 8th and I, which is the Marine Barracks right down the street. The youth of our city. We've been praying for Gallaudet University, which is the only deaf and hearing impaired university in the nation. That's the closest university to our church. Uh, and we've been praying for the LGBTQ community for a revival, for people to experience the power and the presence of God and to get born again, many in that community. And so I want to just strike the ground one more time here this morning. I just believe there's a faith in this room. So I'm going to ask a couple people to pray. Pastor Mark, if you could pray for the military, Nate with youth, um, Elisa, if you could pray for Gallaudet, and then um, I'll pray for the LGBTQ community. So Nate, why don't you kick it off? Pastor Mark can follow. So, Father God, as we come to you today, knowing that we are child, children of God, we are children of you, and we just pray for the children here, Father God. Um, there's so many children in this city, in the surrounding areas, in this country that, that need stability. They need somebody who is there for them. They need to experience the love. And, and the consistency and the faithfulness that you provide. So Father God, I pray that you change our hearts as leaders, as parents, as adults, as mentors. Give us the ability to, to pour out love, to pour out care and consistency into these kids' lives. I pray that the children are able to have role models to look up to. I pray that their schools are safe. I pray that when they walk home, they stay safe from gun violence, from, from anything that comes against them. Father God, in this city, we pray for the children and the youth. Please keep them safe. Please give them spaces to, to pursue you, to ask questions, to grow, and to love you, and give us the strength to love them as well. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Um, as just before Pastor began to give that word at the end about striking the ground, Debbie had that same word. You know, if you tuned in to the Holy Spirit frequency, you're probably hearing some of these things. Uh, another passage, God inhabits the praises of his people. So when we praise God, what we really do, what happens is God comes and inhabits our praises. And so we're not just trying to get ourselves in a good mood for preaching. <laughs> we're literally worshiping. And we don't know what it does to the demonic, but I know it does, they don't like it. And it opens the heavens up. And when the heavens are opened up, it's like a portal. And the, the Spirit of God pours out. He wants us to work with Him to win the city. Not, a, not just He's not just going to do it. We work together to do it. And so He's inhabiting our praises here this morning. So let's lift up and let's ask for big things because our God is big. And all things are possible with Him. Father, we, we, we bring the city before you this morning. We bring the military, Father. We bring, Father, all those young men right down the street. We ask you for souls in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you would pour out your spirit from on high. We pray, Father, that you would open up the heavens above this church and above all the other churches. Lord, that there would be portals all over this city of the Holy Spirit's fire, of the Holy Spirit's life and joy and love pouring out upon our people, pouring out upon the citizens of Washington, D.C. Lord, we pray we bring every institution, our military, our government, our, our colleges, and Father, we ask you for a miracle of grace. Inhabit, Lord, the praises of Grace Covenant Church Capitol Hills. Praise, we pray in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We're going to lift up uh, our campus, Gallaudet University, which Stephen said it's about a mile away from here. Father, we thank you for this campus. We thank you, God, that we are strategically placed just outside of this campus, Lord, that it's no coincidence that we're right here in the same neighborhood. And Lord, right now we ask that you would open up the doors of that campus. God, the harvest is plentiful. 
we see these students walking around in our neighborhood at the grocery stores and God we are asking for an open door on this campus God that you would send a campus minister that is proficient in ASL American Sign Language God we thank you for putting this campus on our heart because we know that it's on your heart too so Father we lift up this campus help us Lord to hear your voice as it concerns how to reach these students and we just thank you God for making a way in Jesus name amen Heavenly Father, we're lifting up the LGBTQ community, Lord. Lord, it's not by accident that you have placed us here, Lord. Like a block from us, Father God, there is a community that meets God. Like you've placed us here for a reason, God. And I know, Father God, that you're going to open doors for us to reach them, Father God. Lord, that they are going to feel like welcomed in this place, Father God, and they're going to encounter you in this place, Father God, and their lives are going to be changed, God. The lies of the enemy, Father God, that they've been told, Father God, will be removed, God. So, Lord, we thank you, God, for using us, God. We thank you for placing us here, God, and we're we're waiting in expectation for what you're going to do, God. So we pray for deliverance, God, and we pray, Father God, that you continue to equip us, God, and so we can win the city, Father, in Jesus' name. Father, we yield ourselves as your people here in Capitol Hill. God, we all have different stories, different time frames, and how long we're here. But in this moment, you've saw it fit in your wisdom to bring us together, to see this community one to Jesus, to see Ward 6 one to Christ. And so we look to you. In many ways, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you, Jesus. Lastly, this morning, I want to...